Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Data Art series of webinars on trends, technology, and thought leadership. Today's webinar titled Automate to Regenerate Part 2, Cost Optimization Case Studies and Travel, will focus on recent successful cost optimization stories from the travel industry. Please welcome our moderator, Focusrite founder, and serial board director, Mr. Philip Wolf. All right, thank you, Marcus. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone all over the world. Today's session, part two, is, as you heard, an ongoing part of an ongoing series. And today we're bringing recent case studies to light, demonstrating the importance of automation in today's travel, transport, and hospitality industry. These compelling case studies will be presented by four distinguished guests and I am pleased to introduce them. Please welcome the CTO of Air Health, Mr. Jakob Zivish. Hello, Philip. Good morning, good afternoon, Hi, everyone. Yeah. My name is Jakob, and uh, I'm responsible in my day-to-day -day job for our product portfolio. Great team that is working on it, and obviously the technology that underlies everything. And where are you joining us from today? From Krakow. Krakow in Poland. Krakow, welcome. Poland. And our next speaker, a tech product advisor and former senior vice president of product at Apple Leisure Group, is Jen Pierce. Jen? Hello. Um, yeah, so I am on the business side of technology. My voice stopped working. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm on the business side of technology. So I help companies think about what technology they're building and why. And these days I spend my time mostly coaching and doing some advisory work. And if I'm not mistaken, you were part of the original Expedia team at Microsoft, were you not? Yeah, yep, I was part of the team that took it public back in the, back in the 90s. Uh, that was a few years ago. We should do another webinar on that. That would be fun. And uh, please welcome the former CTO of Flight Center and now strategic advisor, Mr. Ed Silver. Ed. Hey, Philip. Hello, everybody. What are you doing these days? As a day what job. I do in these days, I work at the intersection of technology and product development. And so I'm currently advising a number of companies on how to make it through these times, as well as to innovate uh, and push hard to make sure they can automate and um, get their teams working smart. And finally, the head of Data Arts Travel Practice, Mr. Greg Abbott. Greg, welcome. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I just like to say thank you to my fellow panelists, Jen and Ed and Jakob for joining our second session here. Of course, thank you, Philip, too, for moderating again and, and really a special thanks to the audience. It's because of your follow-up questions from the last session that we decided to do a deeper dive into automation. So thank you guys, looking forward to this. Yeah, should be good. All right, let's get to the good stuff. We're gonna go right into the case studies today. today. Jen, let's begin with you. All right. Well, what I thought I would focus on today, and let me just, uh, there we go. Um, what I thought I'd focus on today are um, robots that handle cues for you. And I'll explain what I mean by this. Um, following up on the questions I got after the last webinar we did, this was an area of definitely curiosity where I got a fair amount of questions. Um, let's see here says I'm controlling Marcos's screen. There we go. Um, so the reason why I chose this example is because it's one of the places where it kind of feels like magic when we do this, but it's also one of the easier um, items in my experience that I have been able to implement over the years. So uh, in many businesses, especially, tra especially travel companies, we have places where some system somewhere um, sometimes humans, but a lot of times it's a system, is sending messages to us that pile up either in an email inbox or I still find examples out there where people are getting faxes. These days, hopefully they're electronic faxes, not paper faxes, but the gist is the same, right? Messages kind of pile up and we have to have human beings sit there and monitor those inboxes and then work them as they come through. And what tends to happen is a combination of A, it's pretty mind numbing, right? This is the type of uh, task that uh, is, is deeply not fun to work on. Um, as a result, it can be tricky to stay on top of the timeliness of it. It's the type of thing that things can um, sort of uh, not get to the top of the attention when actually they're quite urgent. 
And also occasionally you can have something slip through. And often with these inboxes, if something slips through, the mistake can be very expensive. And I'll go through a couple of examples of that. And so my quick steps for looking for these types of opportunities to see if you have them in your organization is, first of all, look for where employees are having to sit on top of an inbox um, or monitor some sort of, of queue. And like I said, usually they tend to be email inboxes in most of the examples I've had recently. Um, and then, uh, you know, and this is where every company is different. If they have the technology help in house, um, and I should apologize to my CTO uh, brethren here on this call. I use the word script a little generically, but the idea that you know a little program can be written to parse the message, and then you can decide what to do about it. And one of the reasons why I also love these examples is because you can make progress um, in little tiny bite-sized pieces. It's easy to imagine a world where you've automated all of it and it's magical, um, but you can get your way there in steps. You don't have to do a big bang. So, um, and my note at the bottom, uh, sometimes I've been with companies where they do the first part, they, they you know, automate something, they're very excited about it, um, but then things break. My favorite example is whoever's sending you the email just changes their format one day and forgets to tell you about that. Um, and so it is helpful to think about ahead of time, how are we going to do this when this is breaking? All right. So, so two quick examples I brought here that are real life examples. Um, and these are both examples I have um, either implemented or seen implemented at multiple companies. So one was the airline schedule changes. Um, I should note another benefit of this is that that way when these are the types of things that tend to happen in big peaks and valleys with big floods, that's where human beings sitting on top of an inbox can have a hard time staying on top of it. And so these things can really help uh, keep the processes happening. So um, for, I think from March 12th though, through the end of April or May, there was all peaks and no valleys. Yeah, and all desperately <laughs> terrible peaks, yeah. Um, but I mean, I was surprised to realize like, oh my goodness, yeah. So when the airlines were moving schedules around, um, they were generating emails, right? And that that was coming into email boxes. And what's so maddening is that every time a change happens, it could be a one minute change and we were still getting them. I do believe that's a little bit better in some places. But some changes are like, they move the flight time by two minutes. Sometimes it is, I literally had one last week where they moved my flight a month. Um, uh, so, um, and processing all of those, a human being reading each one, deciding what to do, routing it accordingly, very, very time consuming. Um, and so initially it's just having, you know, training the script to basically figure out which ones are big moves, which ones are little moves and then having different workflow based on if it is a tiny change, um, you know, sort of a medium change or a huge change. For the tiny changes where it was just one minute or two minutes, we actually could decide, you know what, um, we don't need to call the customer about this. We don't even need to email the customer about this. We can just accept it and move on versus the bigger changes that required either an email out to the customer, in which case the follow-up automation was to let them accept it right there from the email as opposed to them having to contact a human or reply with a message. Um, or, and then, of course, the big ones, like when you move somebody's flight a month, that maybe is worth um, a bigger phone call or an email conversation, at least. So uh, this was a lot of people's time that was saved so they could focus on more important things. And it helped customers get sort of more timely reactions so they weren't finding out, um, you know, weren't finding out down the road that, that uh, you know, when it was too late and things had moved too much. Yeah. The other example I brought is around um, stop cells. I wanted to bring a lodging example since I know we talk a lot about plane tickets. And uh, let's see here. So word to my colleagues there, apparently it, it takes a moment to think about it. Hopefully it doesn't for, uh, go any further. Um, so stop cells. I think many of the people in the travel industry can appreciate that when a hotel like needs to issue a stop cell order, you have a very small window to implement that stop cell. And uh, one of the cases that I saw, and again, this has been implemented in multiple places, but the, the big problem was when um, those weren't processed in a timely fashion, people just kept booking stuff that we weren't supposed to be selling. And so then you have all kinds of cascading problems that emerge around, you have to contact the customer, let them know that they have to be moved. They're generally, especially with a big vacation, they are not happy about that. They thought a lot about that hotel. Um, and the fact that you showed it as available when it wasn't is bad. And they're Jennifer, very- could, could I ask though, 
you uh, talk about uh, writing parsing scripts to uh, read these emails. Uh, how difficult is that? Do the, does each company have to do it themselves? Are there third parties that have developed like a semantic ontology expertise at this? Can you dig a little deeper into parsing? Sure. Well, and I've had the pleasure of working at a range of companies, right? So from, you know, the Expedia days, I had like, you know, hordes of engineers that would write like whatever thing we wanted them to write on this. And I, I will not pretend to know what technology they used to do it. Um, but, you know, that is a, a, a very different world than most travel companies find themselves in. Um, you know, uh, most recently, I would say a combination of um, I actually did partner with data art on some of these types of projects where we could articulate the business need really clearly and think through the business logic and the flow. But then I have always been in the position of partnering with the technologist to actually get the technology implemented. Yeah. Um, sometimes I had that internal, but a lot of times I didn't. And that's when I would use external partner. And Jen, so, uh, looking uh, at Jen, technology, maybe a quick note from my side. Uh, I'm a big fan of simple solutions and uh, we implemented uh, really good uh, email parsers at our help simply by implementing XPath uh, and regular expressions. So no fancy AI, uh, simple coding uh, was able to fix 70% of, of what we needed. Oh, cool. Thank you. We have an audience question for Jen. Marcos? Jen, regarding the schedule changes coming by email, if the target group here are the travel agents, why would they receive a notification by email and not through a GDSQ? Oh, fair question. Um, and actually, funny enough, I think um, one person who worked with me on these is probably in the audience and might be able to actually answer it in the chat. That's our um, person. Uh, uh, for a lot of the product that I have been working on for the past several years. Um, I, we were typically contacting the travel agents for a lot of the types of bookings we had. I don't believe we used GDS messaging to communicate a lot with agents directly, um, but I could be mistaken and I would encourage Carl to, if he's there to uh, reply in the chat if I've got it wrong. Great. Um, by the way, I should point out many of the businesses I worked on were also um, had consumer facing channels. In fact, all of them have had consumer facing channels. So I am equally talking about the consumer facing piece. Great question. Um, right. Okay. I think we've probably covered off on the items so, that I had there. Jen, so you say you're on the business side of product, which makes yeah. me way more comfortable asking you questions, not being a guy geek either. Yeah. So what have you experienced in terms of companies say, okay, I want to automate the email, inbound email. Uh, what kind of expectations could you help the audience set, maybe a range, yeah. on what kind of efficiency gains are achievable uh, yeah. when you embark on this kind of uh, automation? Yes. Well, um, perfect question. So first of all, I'll say it's important that they always anchor on what is the outcome that matters most. I have had companies that spent way too much juice trying to automate something that was gonna save them like 10 grand at the end of the day um, and was not worth the amount of effort they put into it. Um, and it can feel really good, the activity, and then you don't think about the economic view enough. You really need to start with your economic view. Um, the biggest items um, where you have the most opportunity. And this is where things like time motion studies and the like will help you immensely. And those don't need to be fancy. You can do them yourself with a post-it note watching people do stuff. Um, is where you're actually able to eliminate the need for a human to touch something at all. Those are the ones that have the biggest impact. Um, those are the ones that tend to take, you know, the most technical work to get done, but it can be surprising how light that technical work can be back to the office point. Um, I really recommend that people spend just a little bit of time observing and sort of tallying what people are doing, the human beings who are doing these really, you know, rope cue work and look yeah. for the items that have the highest frequency and then look for how long the handle time is on each of them and use that. Um, and, but I've had times where we reduced the amount of manual time people, the majority of time was able to be shrunk right down. 
I did like Jakob's point. Um, people get too obsessed with trying to automate everything, and like seventy percent is. Yeah, I like what you said about nibble yeah. away, away at it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Before we go to our next case study, uh, for those of you interested, there uh, Rian and Carl both posted uh, answers and uh, I would say elaboration on the GDS questions. So I won't reread them, but uh, you got some. Uh, Good conversation with really Jen. Thank you very much. Uh, Jakob, let's switch over to Poland and air help. What do you got? Sure. Okay, am I controlling the screen? Yes, I am. Perfect. Uh, at AirHelp, we made a strategic decision to automate our claim processing back in 2016, shortly after I joined the company. So over those uh, four years, we learned uh, quite a bit about uh, robotic process automation. And today, I would like to share with you a story of our first robo lawyer, Lara. So AirHelp... Just, uh, just to interrupt, in case the mm -hmm. people don't know, and. Uh, these are customers emailing AirHelp seeking assistance at, in receiving a claim from an airline. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Philip, for this introduction. So, AirHelp, our company, helps passengers get compensation for disrupted flights. Uh, like you say, people are emailing us, contacting us, uh, going to our web funnel, uh, asking for help uh, when they, their flights were delayed, when they suffered. Uh, delays at the airports, maybe for some long hours. Uh, and this is where we come into play. And uh, legal assessment is a critical step of the entire process of, of claiming compensation. Because if an airline rejects our compensation claim, we need to double check whether we want to go to the court with such a claim. And uh, costs of an error at this step are really expensive because on the one hand, uh, mm -hmm. we are missing an opportunity to, to secure compensation for a traveler, a person uh, who was on a delayed flight. On the other, if, if this is a false negative, if uh, we lose, then we first of all lose credibility and secondly, need to cover legal costs, which are also pretty high. So the initial approach here was uh, to train and uh, scale a team of paralegals that would analyze each case separately. And uh, you can believe me, I, I did such a few cases uh, on my own. This is tedious work uh, and it's error prone. And seasonally, uh, there are the backlogs are, are, are piling because uh, the demand is, is quite high for, for what we are doing. Jakob, during peak time, just so the audience understands, how many claims are you getting per week or per month? Or Per week, it will be right, like 40,000 claims, uh, 40, 35,000 claims. Right. That's so a quite, a, quite a few. And obviously, we could employ more and more people, but uh, there are limits uh, of people that uh, office buildings can, can fit. Uh, yeah. It was in pre-corona times when people worked from offices, actually. Uh, so it was one of the reasons why we decided to automate it. But the other was, was uh, human errors. And this is really tough job, right? This is really a job that requires you to think, but it's uh, repetitive. So. Our first approach to Lara, Lara 1.0, uh, was created together uh, with uh, our legal agents. And uh, by working with them, uh, we selected meaningful signals. So we identified uh, what is meaningful in, in the claim that passengers are submitting with us uh, and uh, used more and more sophisticated methods to uh, create some machine learning models. We started from uh, linear re regression, which is fairly common, and uh, progressed up to convoluted neural networks that are uh, deep learning methods uh, to build more and more sophisticated uh, algorithms. And uh, I think it was a success. Lara 1.0 was a success because uh, we were able to cover 66% of uh, all the cases uh so we we were proud of ourselves yeah before fantastic. that it was all before that it was all manual before that manual all manual so you know i would say that uh, 
25, 30% of, of the claims that are getting submitted to us and rejected by airlines. Uh, so let's say at peak times, 10,000 claims a week needed some human interaction. Eight minutes, 10,000 claims uh, you, you get also if you are seeking for an ROI and calculating uh, if it makes sense, uh, 8,000 minutes uh, a week. This is, this is something, right? Uh, so automating 66% of this was a success. And I think we owe this uh, to, first of all, the fact that we mapped out the process reasons for decision. We really understood how agents are assessing the claims. It wasn't like get all the signals and put it uh, into some Google uh, black box and get the results, right? It was rather we really invested into understanding what's happening here. Uh, also, knowing from the past, we knew how important it is to engage stakeholders in the process of creating automation because uh, costs of error are high so our stakeholders want to have confidence want to be sure that when a bot makes a decision then this is this will be the right decision and then bot's decision uh, to what you said Jen, before bot decisions were applied automatically because uh, if you just show notification to uh, an agent hey this is legally viable or this is not legally viable then agents uh, will be tempted to double check the bot uh, and uh, we are not going to to see the uh, benefits of automation right so mm. uh, this was this is really nice story but it doesn't end here uh, because uh, we are in 2018 and uh, we did what was necessary, but then 2019 came and we saw that the demand for our services continues to grow. So we knew that uh, we need to make our bots even smarter. And uh, how do I switch the slide? Okay, and then uh, we started working again with our stakeholders. I'm, so this is kind of story repeated. Uh, we started working again with our uh, stakeholders, trying to understand all the reasons for the decisions, trying to understand why agents are saying this is legally viable, this is not legally uh, viable. And by doing it, cr we created a set of rules. So instead of going for super fancy AI, we could uh, implement a simple, maybe not so simple, right? But uh, rule-based <laughs> system uh, that actually was able to cover 90% of cases with the same 95% wow. confidence level. And who are but, your stakeholders in this context? Your legal uh, advisors, your customers? This is, this is our uh, legal This is our legal teams, right? This is uh, team. okay. the people that are responsible for making sure that when we go to the court, we win the case. We, we as Arthur want to be sure that when we sue an airline, we, we win. So uh, they were really anxious to, to ensure that uh, confidence level is 95% because uh, we couldn't compromise ourselves uh, at court. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, most of the success here uh, is related to, okay, uh, to the fact that uh, we really invested upfront into clarifying, clearing the process, removing uh, human bias or, or the noise uh, from the learning set. And yeah. uh, actually we ended up in a situation uh, where we really didn't need to in implement uh, fancy AI. We simply yeah. went for a rule-based system. And, and before you wrap up there, uh, Marcos, I do see a question here from Kate, sorry. Uh, Quickly, what criteria do you use to evaluate the passenger experience? Like, how, how do you know you're improving the, that customer experience? Uh, well, improving the overall passenger experience, uh, we are uh, doing service. We are uh, asking uh, people about their opinion about our help. Uh, we are checking our NPS. Uh, we are monitoring Trustpilot and other sources. Uh, right. So this is uh, by doing customer research yeah. in various what, Yeah, and what percent of uh, claims or claim requests, whatever you call them, are rejected because your automation estimates that there's a poor chance of recovery from the airline? Mm, it depends how you count, uh, because there are many steps at which we are rejecting travelers. So there is, uh, at first, there is basic eligibility check uh, in the funnel. And at this point, uh, we are rejecting around 50% uh, of, of 50, travelers. 50, five, zero, half? Five, zero, half. Wow. Half, half of people that uh, go through our web form uh, learn that their claim is ineligible. 
Uh, and uh, then going further, uh, we do another analysis uh, with, with uh, bots um, going through documents, that, uh, if they were needed, going through other factors. Yeah. And uh, we are rejecting uh, additional uh, 10, 15 uh, percent, 10, yeah. 15, 20, wow. depending on the season. Uh, so yeah. that's quite um, a lot. Yeah. Jacob, how big is your how big is your development team just to give the audience a sense of the size of team it takes to do this kind of automation? Uh, it depends what you ask because you know entire uh, engineering team or product engineering team at our help is around 100 people. However, if you are asking about uh, this case, uh, Lara, Lara 1.0 was uh, implemented by I think two engineers. Uh, one of them was really focused on product and then uh, very experienced guy, and the other was experienced guy. Uh, yeah, regarding the second version, uh, I think we had uh, three or four people working on it. Uh, at first, uh, we invested a lot into you know going through uh, the process with agents, so it was more of a product work, uh, if you will. And then implementation was actually quite simplistic yeah. in comparison Great. to the first version. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, glad you were able to join our team. Ed, let's turn things over to you. Okay, great. Let me see if I have control here. There we go. All right, so during the last uh, webinar that we did, uh, I had talked about RPA a couple of times and I was stopped cold um, by the question that, that people did not know what RPA stood for um, and so RPA. I was one of them. I was one, of, one them. of them. And so RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation. Um, and I'm going to give you, walk you through a use case of using RPA. And if you don't mind, I'll keep calling it RPA. Um, and it stands for Robotic Process Automation. And so the, the problem statement for when you would want to use something like RPA is uh, the example that, that we used in a previous company was new client. And a new client is what we refer to as an awesome problem. This is a great problem to have, a high class problem. But depending on the complexity of your business and the previous business that I was in, every new client meant that you had about a dozen, two dozen, sometimes three dozen uh, systems and steps you had to go through in order to implement that new client. And in the corporate, um, travel space, that means online booking tools, policy setup, we've got sales systems and tracking, you've got GDS configuration, uh, you've got project management software, customer service management software, uh, and each of these different systems requires that that new client be configured and set up within in order for that client to actually go live and be able to, to actually perform any transactions. And so a new client is great, but you need an entire team to go through and do each of those steps. How Ed, can what, RPA? What was the time for that onboarding? Like, how, like give the audience an idea of how, how long it would take to bring on a new customer. Yeah, I mean, it could take anywhere from nine to 15 weeks, sometimes even longer, 20 weeks in some cases. Some of that, some of that is out of people's control because it's an, a, another <laughs> party you're waiting for, or you could be waiting for the client to actually answer questions. But uh, much of that time can be cut out and I'll kind of walk you through how you do that. And so when can you use a robot? You can use a robot um, and an RPA to cut down that implementation time. Let me show you an example of that. Um, oh, just real quick. So I stole this off of one of the RPA vendors. And once we send this out, you can read through what the actual definition of RPA is. But any action that a human can take when they are interacting in particular, in this use case, with the web, any web form, uh, any um, platform as a service, software as a service, anything you have to fill out a form for as a human, a robot can be trained to do that for you. And so in this use case, where we're talking about implementing a new client, all of the systems that we use throughout this particular client's um, ecosystem were web-based forms, but each one was a different setup, a different login, a different vendor. And so how do you go through and do that and replicate that across all of those systems in order to 
provide that implementation faster and faster. And so when you look at RPA, it's all about building a robot that never sleeps and does not make mistakes as long as you train it appropriately. So here's the example, and, and we, we named this pilot um, that we went through, Sally, um, just, to get, just to give it a name. And the idea here is you have a new corporate client and you've got company data. Um, where do they uh, have headquarters? Uh, what's their main office? Where do they travel? What's their policy data? In other words, can they have more than three people on a plane, executives on a plane? Are they allowed first class? <clears throat> and if you're familiar with some of the online booking tool implementation systems, you might know that they are fairly archaic in their setup. Um, the one I'm showing here is a fairly well-known online booking tool, but to be honest, most of the OBTs out there have this back-end setup process that is reasonably manual and takes a long time to both learn as well as to implement a new client. But what you can do is watch these professionals go through the process of collecting the data from the, from the company, putting it into a spreadsheet or into a database if you want to get more sophisticated, and then training your robot as you watch that user go through each of these web pages and you go through and fill out the form using the spreadsheet data and then the robot can hit submit, submit, submit as you go through each of the steps of updating and implementing a new client just for the online booking tool portion of it. And this, this, this can get complicated and do you get pushback from clients or how do you navigate the human side of this? Yeah, I mean, what you're doing is you're empowering folks to take the manual elements out of their day so they can right. move up and work on um, the, the higher value type of activity, working with the client, helping them understand the policies. You give the staff the time to do the higher value things and take some of the manual elements out of their work. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, there can be some complexity to it, especially for the OBT side and for the online booking tool side. But the, the idea is you're training this robot just once and then you can apply it to each new company as you bring on um, new clients. And are you finding the uh, interest level among the mar in marketplace clients has gone up for this kind of automation post coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, everybody talks broadly about digital transformation, in particular during this period. And I will tell you that RPA is at the heart of digital transformation. If you're not at least experimenting with how to automate things that you do manually today, then you're, you're making a mistake in terms of your, your current business path. This is not hard to do. It looks complicated just because my spreadsheet design, my little PowerPoint design is, um, is not the prettiest, but the idea behind it is actually fairly simple. You let the robot watch you fill out any form on any system, and then it can repeat that again and again and again for each new client. Yeah. Greg, I, I get the feeling you've got a question, Greg. <laughs> Sally's got to be an acronym, right? <laughs> Sally, Sally, Sally is, an, is, an, an inside, is an inside joke. Okay. I, uh, okay. I'm just going to have right. to comment as the one woman on the panel and be like, guys, you got to stop naming the robots all girl names, especially when they're assistants. Just going yeah. okay. to put this out La there. La La Lara, right. could, Lara could be a guy's name. Ed, Ed uh, we have an audience question for you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can we go Marco? back? Go back sure. a slide. Ed. Go ahead, Marcos. There you go. So, Edward, can the robot be trained with multiple ben vendor system? Ah, uh, so especially when uh, there are some legacy systems. Yes, the the answer is absolutely. And and the the, the best part about experimenting and piloting with um, RPA like this is once you've got the data in either a spreadsheet or preferably in a database, and maybe that's um, complexity for another webinar in the future, you then can use that same data, not just to set up an OBT, but your Zendesk, your Salesforce, your Basecamp or monday.com, right? It, it really doesn't matter. If, if your staff can manage 
implementation through these web-based tools, internal legacy tools or externally managed tools. If it's a web-based form, the, the RPA can actually be trained to do it. And if you look right. at some of the use cases um, of the RPA, it goes way beyond just web-based form. You can actually manipulate faxes and documents and RPA can go very, very far in, in its use cases. Right. But the key with this particular pilot was can we begin to use it to, you know, to fill out all of these different systems and overall the business problem you're trying to solve is reduce implementation time from months down to weeks and possibly less. If you can bring the revenue in sooner, why wouldn't you do that? And so that's yeah. the whole benefit behind RPA. Right. Um, and th then one last slide, just so Ed, you Can see you quick uh, uh, wrap up so we can go to the fourth case study? You bet. Just a quick example yeah. of some of the RPA vendors out there. Um, pick the one that you're the most comfortable with and don't be afraid to experiment. This does not require significant technical experience. Go out and try it. How many of these have you worked with or experienced working with? So I, uh, of the ones on this list, I've actually used four um, and I'm sure Datart has experience in many of them. Yeah, I was going to say UiPath, Automation Anywhere, and Blue Prism, you, you probably can't go wrong using one of the top yeah. three companies. Great. Thank well, you, Greg. Uh, thank you. Last, thank you. But not least, <laughs> turn it over to thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you, Ed. Um, so our last case is in um, the maritime uh, and transportation sector of the industry. So I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to set the stage for this less known segment. Um, initially, we began working with a wholly owned travel agency of this global shipping services provider. We uh, met the executive team and particularly the COO had a BHAG vision. Um, for those of you who don't uh, read Jim Collins, Built to Last, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And so he had this BHAG vision um, and like many, he loved benchmark analogies. And so the COO would often say, hey, hey, we, we wanna become like the Starbucks of the maritime industry. Um, not the world's best coffee, but you, you can't argue that it's highly consistent, service oriented and easy to access. This company works with like two to 300 local agents in ports, ports all over the globe. And they noticed that a few of the local port agencies had like productivity three to four times better than, than other port agents. And they really wanted consistent service across their customers who are the ship owners to experience that consistency in every port around the globe and they knew that a technology would enable them to move in that direction. So the COO had clear objectives. He wanted to modernize existing processes. He wanted to improve productivity, increase consistency, and along the journey, they believed that this would also help them standardize high quality data within their systems, which would enable them to take the next step towards uh, employing some machine learning techniques, applying to that data. Eventually what they wanted to do was actually project port costs to their clients, to their customers. And Greg, yeah. this client came to you with this vision or was it developed during the engagement? Yeah, amazingly. So we started working on, on just the, sh the ship to shore portion of it. And the okay. COO was a real visionary. He really saw, uh, he, he would, he would uh, constantly tell us, he's like, look, I don't want to get Ubered. And he really saw that the sort of old legacy technology was really uh, hindering them from uh, from growing and from changing within the industry. So, um, so yes, uh, he had the vision, and and we got to adopt to it. So, um, go on to the next slide here. So, if, at first glance, that may not seem like a BHAG vision, you know, Starbucks and all analogy. But let me paint a little more complexity on the on the color of the core part of their business. So. A single port is complex. So for example, their customer could be uh, BP or Exxon and the shipping agent serves uh, to sanitize 12 to 24 local relationships in every port call. They pre-estimate the expenses relative to that call and they got to track the cost change over the time of the port call. Um, the port window itself can change because of weather and schedule. Um, the crew movements have to be tracked. So the old crew gets off and the new crew comes on and travel for all those people all around the world. Then there's the husbandry, which is refueling and servicing the ship. And, and all of that is time boxed. And then of course, time itself is a variable. Um, after all of that, then there's still the financial reconciliation on the back end part, uh, which includes, you know, the cost centers of these local guys are not equal to the, to the ship owners. 
Um, there's uh, currency in all the different countries that they're working with, constant currency conversion because they're paying at one time, receiving funds at another time. Um, each of their customers, so Exxon and BP, they have their own preferences for how they're coding um, costs and, and different approval tiers. It's, a, it's actually a pre-flow, a pre-cash payment for some of the port services, so they have cash flow issues. There's a bunch of managed workflows around the KPIs. Uh, there's invoice management, validation, approvals, and all of that's got to be mapped back to the GL. So I, I wrote on here, it's, it's not as complex as a lunar landing, but it is a really complicated uh, um, area of the business. So our team was, was charged with designing and then building this mission critical ERP. And, um, and, it, and it was, it was uh, deemed to, to try to use these tools that we've been talking about today, which would automate the reconciliation between all of these players. Um, and that called for really reimagining mo many of the existing operations and taking a look at the workflows from end to end. And we used these intelligent automation tools to process contextualize and all of the associated emails, the invoices, all the paper trail um, around it. And as a kicker, we had to do this while there was an ongoing rework of the enterprise master data and the general ledger technology. All of that was in progress. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a staunch challenge. How many so people the, on the data art team combined working on this project? It was a, a but between 50 and 60 at the peak of the project. It was a big, big project. And how the, long did it take? Um, the initial part was uh, about a six months, eight months, and then the core development was uh, 12 months, and of course in blocks, right? So we would take areas and show value to the business and then complete, and so it was a, a bit of a, a Lego, but it was uh, overall almost two year project. And what did the business get, right? What, were the, what was the value of the end of the project? What was a carrot at the end? Um, so I would say they got a significant step in their journey towards the BHAG. Um, some of the things that, that, they, they, uh, that automation unlocked for them and most probably the immediate, most immediate recognizable reward was the new system delivered 50% in productivity improvement and around their processes. So they saw this massive productivity improvement. They saw uh, a real reduction in errors, which obviously led to happier customers. Yeah. And they had um, their internal teams, and, and a couple of you have alluded to this in your case studies, so it freed up internal teams to take on higher level service tasks. And that actually made the, the, the employees happier because they were able to get away from some of the inbox management that you were talking about earlier, uh, Jen. So the, the bonus for them was we built this all cloud native and so it required nearly zero training for their own team to maintain. And I would argue that the new system is, is, is helping this sort of thin margin business through this uh, recent COVID crisis. And last slide here. I, I do wanna underline that the journey is not done. So if you remember the BHAG and where they were trying to get to, um, this is not uncommon for modernization of some of the underlying technologies. It's a precursor to really unlocking uh, transformation or what people throw loosely around as this sort of digital transformation. But um, they're, they're certainly have made a, a big step ahead of their customers and um, beyond what I've described in terms of real tangible financial business outcomes, they now have cleanse data. And from that, they're positioned to be able to use some of the ML and AI tools um, that Jakob underlined um, in his uh, case study. And they want to get to this goal of being able to actually, and nobody's thinking about this, I think, in Maritime, at least from, from my knowledge, about forecasting a fixed cost port call. So right now, it's just they get, they get this big range and nobody really knows the true cost of the port. So they're trying to use the data to actually predict what the port call would be and be able to offer a fixed price to their customers, which I think would be uh, huge once that's accomplished and um, it will likely be a first for the maritime industry. Wow. So, yeah, thank that's you. Good. It's, it's amazing how there are aspects of travel, tourism, hospitality and transport that are huge, but uh, they don't occupy the daily uh, newsletter and conference uh, top topics until the supply chain is broken like it was during COVID, <laughs> and then everybody feels yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I called that the negative economy where everyone was working really hard to lose money. Yes, odd, exactly. Odd times. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is great. And I think I gotta go. There we go. Oh, good. 
Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any uh, other questions that we need to? Well, I'm just going to ask you guys before we wrap up a closing thought. It, it, you know, put your consulting hats on. I realize not all of you are consultings, but uh, how would you help the people in the audience? And I see this very, very nice number today. If somebody asked them, what was your biggest takeaway from today's uh, automation to regenerate webinar? What might you say? What might you recommend? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay. I mean, I'm gonna say, almost the same thing I said on the last webinar, because I think it's really important, which is um, don't be afraid to experiment and start small with pilots. Even frontline folks can use these technologies to go ahead and experiment with automating your day-to-day -day practice. Um, and you, you know, I mentioned that your kind of your CTO will thank you if you begin experimenting, don't be afraid of breaking things. This is the time to really get out there and, and try yeah. things on your own. I couldn't agree more. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. I think Ed, you you nailed it. I, I it's really about um, a lot of these tools. You can start small and you can start with the Lego approach. So I think it's about and you know you've listed some of the um, you know there's two approaches. Build it like Jakob's team did from scratch, you know, parsing system from scratch, use some of the, uh, the tools that are out there that, are, uh, that can be easily uh, spun up and customized to kind of break down a small project and start getting your hands around how this can benefit your business. Yeah. And I think I'll just build on that, and I also might be saying something I said in the last webinar, but um, helping companies who maybe don't think of themselves as having enormous engineering teams realizing these things can still very much be in reach some people they hear robots and they kind of their eyes glaze over like oh we could never do that but because the technologies are coming so far um especially as it relates to like low code solutions um they really are just so much more accessible than they ever have been before yeah yeah i get that all the time Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be summarized with simply focusing on solving the actual problem instead of uh, just focusing on technology. Yeah, interesting. Should always Ladies and gentlemen, Jakob Zivic, Jen Pierce, Ed Silver, and Greg Abbott, thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Philip. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye.